Last week, you may remember, I broke Radio 4 and received a thorough wicking and detention from Mr. Checkland. I spent most of the week picking up the bits with a commission air. Look, Radio 4 is almost brand new. I mean, what a waste. Now, look at that, look. The main screen's gone on the shipping forecast. Look, Trumpet is burnt out. No, no, lick of paint, lick of paint. Good as new. That's about as good as new. About as good as new. Pass over those bits of Margaret Howard. Oh, look, the head's still working. Hello again. Hello again. Hello again. Hello again. Oh, I don't like it. No, I don't like it. Give me the willies, that does. I don't like it. Give the head off. It's my own fault, they told me, but I would not listen. I fiddled with Radio 4 so much that the Baconite snapped and green stuff came out. Sailing by is warped. Does he take sugar is no more than a sea of twisted chrome, and the transmitters have become so weak that the long wave has been invaded by Warsaw Radio, so from now on, Jenny Murray is likely to have a bit of pole in her. Woo! As a result of my wickedness in big school, the head of house, Mr. Marmalade Butty, stops my pocket money, and I find myself in penury. <laughs> Uh, you'll find penury on the northern line, change at Waterloo. Uh, if you're insolvent, you have to change first at Newbury Park. This train terminates here. Mind the gap. I board the train, leaving just a small knot hole for the driver to see through. Now, stay still while I stick this glass up your bottom. Bottom. Otherwise, I'll rip the skin off your back. Back, like back in the flat, I switch on the fictional whippet, yes. which, after much struggling, serious fictional mutilation and fictional amputation of the back legs and fictionally ripping out its tongue, which I do fictionally just to annoy dog lovers and the RSPCA, I have converted into an attractive and fetching lampshade. And that will teach you to get more famous than me, will it not? Oh, I should say there goes the phone now. I should say there goes the phone now. It's the nice Mr. Guardhouse. Hello, Mr. Guardhouse. He is depressed. He is in a state of catatonia. In a state of catatonia. Why are you in a state of catatonia, the nice Mr. Guardhouse? <coughs> You're paying homage? What, to catatonia? Well, I never. What, never? Catatonia, oh, somewhere on the Iberian Peninsula, is where Mr. Guardhouse has been exiled as the man ultimately responsible for my breaking of Radio anyway, 4. What's cooking, baby, as they say at Woman's Hour? <coughs> Going to be re-educated by the BBC? Going to make me nice? Where's the BBC going to send me? Give me a clue, you give me a clue? Where? I find myself in Colcated. Colcated is a small village just outside County Mayo at a secret underground BBC Irish charm school. I'm being instructed in how to be a likeable media personality. Let me explain in pedagogical terms. At the very centre of the BBC is a group of vacuous but ultra-charming professional Irish persons. This benign Cosa Nostra is known in the media as the Murphia and includes the likes of your Terry Wogan, your Henry Kelly, your Gloria Honeyfoot and your Frank Delaney. The British public love to hear charming Irish blarney and well-groomed Irishmen who say desist me hearties with an impish grin while waggling their bodies from side to side. Here is a recording of what's happening between their ears while they exude their blarney. No cerebral activity, no alpha, no beta wave at all. Nothing. But BBC rubber executives prefer smarm to grey matter, for as the Latin motto above Broadcasting House says, Nemo enum sapientum amat. Or in English, no one loves a smart ass. I am forced to take a crash course in BBC smarm. OK, chaps, settle down now. I'm BBC Head of Irish Blarney. So you have your maps of London Underground. TV centres marked with an X. Sure, and I'm starting to lose me accent, pajamas. So get your glittering eye drops for the authentic Irish twinkle. And repeat after me. Sure, Danny boy, doesn't me mother's blue eyes shine like the dairy jewel me heart is? And I'd like £600,000 for next year's contract, Mr. Gray. And how she cotton? Sure, sure Danny, Danny boy, boy, doesn't me mother's blue eyes shine like the dairy jewel me heart I graduate with first-class honours in applied smarm, shave my head, change my name to Al Opecia, and am instantly offered a vacuous chat show. Returning home, I stop en route at the corner shop. Morning, sir. Hello, can I have four corners, please? Yes, sir, you've come to the right shop. Okay. There you are, sir, four corners. Thank you. Bobby, is it, sir? Well, yes, I like making round things square, actually. Oh, oh, oh. nice. Anyway, I've been overdoing the smarm all day and I've got a bit of a headache, you know. Anad oh, Anadin, sir? No, I'll have nothing, thank Look, you. Nothing? Mm. What, why is that, sir? Well, nothing acts faster than Anadin. Uh, oh, I see, <laughs> so, oh, highly <laughs> risible. <laughs> mm. uh, highly risible. Didn't do so well with the Irish accent in the last scene, though, did we? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm afraid I was from my mother's womb untimely ripped. And anyway, I'll thank you to firmly keep your mouth shut! I split my infinitives and leave. Frat. George Washington. Back in the flat, I tune in the radio to hear myself choose eight Desert Island discs for Mr. Parkinson's programme. That's a no choice of, of records. Well, Michael, um, it's 
another sound effect record. Michael, this time it's a vacuum cleaner. Being a charming, likeable BBC personality now, I become emotional. The record has fond memories for me. This disc reminds me of a domestic vacuum cleaner recorded in 1959 mono. I'm so nice and friendly and emotional. I'm so emotional and nice and friendly. I laugh so much at my BBC insincerity that I rupture myself and quickly order a hernia kit over the phone and buy it on credit with my trust card. I pick up my eighth and final sound effect disc. Hello. Hello already. Such a business. So who needs a woman? It's my agent, Mori. Woman, Victor, darling. Why do this to me already? I've told me time and time again. I say me. I say I cannot do a Jewish accent. I know. I like to think I'm the voice of them all. It's pathetic, really. Anyway, me playing the part of an agent. What's cooking? So what's cooking? Great news already. Uh -huh. There's been a terrible national disaster. We got death. We got burning. We got oils choking on fish bones. Oh. We got orphan children. Best of all, we got a charity record. Oh. It'll make you look charming and sincere and caring. Let me explain in my normal voice. Nothing brings a broader smile to the face of a caring, sincere media personality than a colossal natural disaster. Within hours, an appalling charity song will have been written, and more ITN cameras will be outside the recording studio than there are at the scene of the disaster. If you hear about such a recording, remember these tips. One, don't wait to be asked, just turn up. Two, arrive looking ashen-faced and as if you've stayed up all night crying. Three, attempt to block the camera's intrusion into your grief by covering the lens with your hand, but remember, keep those fingers well spread out so that the viewers can see who it is. And four, in the studio, stand next to Tina Turner, and on no account, corpse or show any visible sign of insincerity as you sing your dollop of the banal lyric. I was terribly sorry to hear, in all sincerity, that Mrs. Thatcher's pet tortoise had suddenly ceased to be. It's a shame, it's a shame, that tortoise ain't to blame. Ain't to blame. Fully indoctrinated with BBC Smarm, I reached the apogee of broadcasting insincerity. I'm beautiful people, and you're beautiful. I love you. I love you. Okay, then. Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, I only do eight hours to the gallon on Two Star Economy, Smarm, and run out about now. I've got a dedication here for Granny Lumpen from our daughter Plebs, who lives at the same house, and she says, will you say a special happy birthday to my granny who's in the kitchen at the moment? Well, the answer is no. Why do you want to say hello through a complete stranger when she's in the next room? You can do it yourself, personally. Just get off your fat ass and get into the kitchen and do it yourself instead of bothering me. <laughs> In the psychiatrist's chair. This week, Anthony Clare talks to another red hot favourite for the loony bin, Victor Lewis Smith. My guest today cracked up this morning on Radio 1. Tell me, Victor, why is it that you persist in these uh, dreadful, shocking, truly awful impersonations? Take me, for instance. I sound nothing like this. I never have done. And Begora's. <laughs> He said Begora. I realise that he's one of the Murphy. A quick as a flash, I rip off his face mask to reveal <coughs> Terry Wogan swaying from side to side and saying bejabeds. Yet another disguise, I rip off the face mask. <coughs> this time it's Frank Delaney. What have Frank Delaney, Susan Hill and Hunter Davis got in common? Answer, they've all been remaindered all on bookshelf. And now back to the man who thinks an antiquarian is someone with a grudge against goldfish, Shed Nerin. <coughs>